the Lord in prayer with me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the joy of the Lord that we get to worship you and sing how good you are and how true you are. And Father, this world is pulling us away. And Father, we need to be saturated in your word and your Holy Spirit's presence. Father, may us draw into the body of Christ where we can encourage one another, build each other up. And, and Father, we thank you in times of difficulty that we have the body to intercede and pray for us and, and encourage us, Lord. Lord, so I thank you for that. Lord, I also thank you for uh, every dollar that comes in, Father, that we bless and grow your kingdom. That's what we pray for our missionaries around the world to have uh, fruit and harvest, Father, that there would be come so many drawn into the presence uh, of a, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what we pray for, that you would use us to be a light all over this community. So, Father, we thank you, we celebrate you, we lift up the mighty name of Jesus this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. We're going to be in Psalm 23 this morning. We're also going to be uh, flipping over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you want to kind of hold your spot there as well. One of the things I've noticed as a pastor is that it seems like after high school, maybe college for some, some people start to drift away from the Lord. And I've seen that some people get out maybe in their 20s and they start thinking, Lord, I'm praying about maybe my career, I'm praying about my, you know, my family or a relationship, and they start praying about these things. It doesn't seem like God answers them as quickly as we think he should or the way we think he should. So then people start to drift. They drift away sometimes from church, and then all of a sudden a little bit of drift. All of a sudden it's been six, eight months, they haven't been in church, and all of a sudden they're not really sure what they believe anymore. It's amazing how we can get pulled away. Well, I want you to know, as we wrap up our series today on Psalm 23, that this psalm was written for people like those in those circumstances. David, scholars would believe that he was at one of the lowest points in his life. He was most likely on the run from King Saul, and he was trying to, you know, they were trying to kill him because they were jealous of him, and he was on the run. And so therefore, he literally is, you know, maybe you find your spot, yourself in that situation today. Maybe you find like, ah, Lord, I've been praying about that job and my health, and this, this thing is just not getting answered the way I want it to be answered. And, and so in all of that toughness, David writes this incredible, beautiful psalm. And he literally says that God is there. He's there, even in the moments of those disappointments, even in the moments of those hardships and pain, that God is there. So we've given you three basic points over the last couple weeks. The first week, this was the point, is it's all about the presence of the shepherd. Friend, for the Christian, that should change everything. The presence of the shepherd means it's for our life, our joy, our, our safety, our fulfillment. All of that is wrapped up in our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have no needs. I have no wants. We looked at that, and therefore we looked at the person of Job, right? Remember, Job went through a really tough season. His wife was saying, curse God and die. But Job clung on to faith of obedience, where he had the faith that God would bless those that he loves and that love him and are obedient to him. It also went through, he had to turn into kind of a faith of sufficiency. Like, God, I don't really understand exactly what you're doing right now, but I'm still going to trust you. And I'm going to trust you because the Lord's presence is there, therefore he meets all our needs. The second point we looked at week two, two weeks ago, was that God is always good. He's not just sometimes good. God is always good, but the arc of his goodness is sometimes a little further off than we think it should be. And remember, we talked about the goodness and mercy are always following me. That's what it says. But sometimes we wonder, how far back is that goodness? Right, Lord, I, you know, that mercy, where is your goodness and your mercy? And, and maybe we saw the life of Joseph, right? And Joseph was thrown into the pit by his brothers and sold into slavery in prison. Where's that goodness? God's mercy is following me. His presence is with me, and he holds on to the Lord. Well, the third point that we're going to focus on today is that I want you to understand that God uses these times. He uses these hardships, even this waiting period, to still do good in our lives, 
and he wants to do good in our lives. In Psalm 23, we're going to kind of unpack a few verses and then look at Paul today in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But before we do, I want to read Psalm 23 to you. We've been in it for the last three weeks, and so I want to read this to you. You can follow along on the screen. We're going to have the verses up there, but I want you to know you might want to close your eyes as well and let this sink into your soul. Let me read this for you. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. There is so much goodness there and I want you to know, uh, David talks about all throughout that psalm the goodness of God, that he's still doing a good work in him. So I'm going to break down a couple verses out of here for us before we go to 2 Corinthians. First one is verse 4. If you have your Bibles, turn to verse 4. It says this, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So what does that mean? Your rod and your staff, your rod would have been a, a description of protection and discipline. And staff would have mean guidance. As parents, do you ever have to discipline in order to protect your children? Sometimes maybe they, were, they would be going uh, you know, into the street and they just keep walking in the street. Well, you have to grab them and then sometimes you have to discipline them because you don't want them to hurt themselves, harm themselves. In the same way, at times we have to guide uh, as parents and adults and we have to guide one another. And you go and you seek wisdom through God's word and other Christians and they give you wisdom. This would be wise. This would not be wise. That's what he's talking about here. David's saying, I recognize... This, this affliction, this pain that I'm going through right now is disciplining me, it's shaping me, it's forming me. And even though it feels painful, God, what you're doing is you're taking away my false trust in things of this world. And friends, that's what starts to happen. We start to believe in things of this world and we need to keep our trust in the things of God. And that's what your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jump back to verse three, if you're there. He says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Now, I told you week one, a couple weeks ago, that sheep are incredible animals of creature of habit, okay? So they just walk the same path over and over and over. When they're walking that same path, what happens is the grass eventually dies underneath that path. But then, because they keep walking the path, all of the sheep waste is all along the path. Therefore, parasites and disease start to form on this so that it literally kills the ground and it's unhealthy for them to even walk on. So what happens is the shepherd has to come along and guide them to a new path. And they don't like it at first. Why? Because it's not as familiar. They need to stay close to the shepherd in order to be close to safety. And so they don't like it at first. And that's kind of what happens with us. David's saying, hey, you know what? I'm in a season where you're taking me to a new place. I don't like, you know, this path feels different and it's a little bit uncomfortable. But that path, that new path that the Lord is leading you on is causing you to draw close to him. And that's what he's doing here. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 5, if you can jump there, it says, you anoint my head with oil. Now, a lot of times in Scripture when you anoint with oil, that would have been kind of launching somebody into ministry, okay? Remember when uh, Samuel anointed David as king, he anointed him with oil. But here, what I want you to know, that book that was written by a shepherd I told you about the first week about Psalm 23, he said that there's really three times that somebody uh, would anoint oil on the head of a sheep. He says, number one, it's when there's flies and there's gnats and mosquitoes and it's bugging them to where they no longer eat. And that's what they're supposed to be doing is grazing. So you'd put oil on it and it'd work as a repellent to keep the gnats and the flies and the mosquitoes off of the sheep. The second reason they'd put oil on was when maybe a sheep had a skin disease on their head 
And they would put that oil on it and it would contain it till it healed naturally. So it would keep the whole body from growing sick or diseased. And the third one, which is probably the most interesting one, was they would put oil on the sheep's head when it was mating season, okay? Because uh, maybe you've seen rams, but rams were trying to establish dominance. They will just go at each other and butt heads. And they would do this to the point of really damaging one of, each, one, the, one of the other, and one of them may die. So sometimes the shepherd would put oil on them to help them just slide off of each other. You know, maybe a good idea for some of our teenage boys today as well, you know, that they might not, you know, fight for dominance over these young ladies, okay? So, uh, but that's why they would do it. Now, definitely in Scripture, the Bible would use oil as represents the Holy Spirit. And I think that that's a lot of what is referring to, David's referring to, that in the midst of these trials... In the midst of hardship and difficulty, things not going just like you thought they should, the Spirit is poured out upon us. And what it does is it gives us peace in the midst of those, you know, little things that nag us and annoy us and anxieties that build up. So it gives you a peace. The second thing it does is it also fills you up to fight against, you know, the the pulls of this world, to guard your heart. And so it guards that way. And the third thing the Holy Spirit does is it pours out your love so that you're able to really care for and bless and forgive others in the midst of difficult trials. So that's most likely what was going on in the midst of these trials. God was using this oil. Now I wanted to give you one more from verse 5. It says, my cup overflows. And we've seen this the last couple weeks. What should Christians do at all times? We should be serving. We should be caring And literally, this is not talking about like, I'm just so full of the Lord. You walk around, I'm full of the Lord. This is you're so full of the Lord that it's overflowing out of you. And we talked about what happens when you squeeze a lemon. Lemon juice comes out, right? Because that's what's inside. And so what comes out of you if if literally you've been cut, if you've been hurt, if someone persecutes you? Does the grace of Jesus, does more of his spirit and his presence come squeezing out of you? Because in this time of maybe difficulty or hardship, we should be soaking in the word of God and his presence, crying out to him that he's a good God. So literally, it overflows from us. So God uses these times of waiting to do good work in your life. And I want to encourage you with that today. So if you have a moment, flip over to 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at just a few verses, 7 through 10. If you have it, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul, we've looked at a number of characters. We looked at Job and Joseph and Naaman last week. Today we're going to look at Paul. Paul would have most likely had this passage in Psalm 23 just memorized and known it by heart. So we're going to look at how Paul lives out this same concept that we're talking about in Psalm 23. So verse 7, this is what it says. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation... What does that mean? I want you to know real quickly, Paul was given the the task of speaking for the Lord. The Holy Spirit would speak through him. He would write it down. That would have possibly made him pretty, you know, know, haughty in his own eyes. He would have thought, you know what, wait a second, you know, I'm writing for the Lord. I have the same thoughts of the Lord. He could have got pretty built up. So the Lord gave him a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from being conceited. Now, real quickly, I want you to see conceited has been mentioned twice there. So clearly that's the purpose, to keep me from being so built up and conceited. Verse 8 and 9 and 10. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, I love this passage. And so we're just going to break down a few things that I want to point out of it. First of all, Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. Does anybody want to know what that thorn in the flesh is? 
I mean, don't some of you want to know what that thorn in the flesh is? Like, we wonder, right? And, and I got to tell you, you know, a lot of people, commentaries, books have been written about what that thorn in the flesh might have been. You wonder, and I got to tell you, some of the commentaries would say it was uh, maybe a eye disease that caused him to be, his eyes to kind of ooze out, and it was very painful and kind of gross, and it was very, that could definitely have been a thorn in his flesh, absolutely. Others believe it might have been people, like his, some people that he would relate to that would kind of always come at him, and that might have been his thorn in the flesh, and that very well could have been as well. Paul refers to both of those problems in his writings um, at some point. But the bottom line is we don't know. We don't know, do we? And why doesn't Paul tell us? Well, let me tell you, when the Holy Spirit leaves it vague, he leaves it vague for a reason, okay? So why would he not, you know, tell us what the thorn was? Maybe so you and I could fill in the blank with our thorn, right? I'm assuming a lot of you have some thorns in your side, right? And so you, because if we would have known what it was, we would have compared, right? That's what would have happened. We would have said, okay, some of us would have said, okay, Paul, your thorn was way more serious than mine. Mine doesn't even compare to yours, so therefore God probably doesn't even, he's not concerned with mine. We might have said that. Or if yours was more serious than Paul's, we would say, oh man, Paul, you got that. I got this. I mean, this is way more. I mean, God, how could you possibly even have a purpose in something this bad? And we'd say, you know, look at mine. We compare. And probably even worse, some of us would say, you know what? I got the exact same one as Paul, right? Me and Paul, we have the same issue. And so therefore, you know what? I'm clearly pretty special, right? I mean, that's kind of what we would have thought because we think this suffering thing is a competitive sport. And friend, it's not a competitive sport, okay? We don't have to uh, one-up each other with how, you know, horrible my, you know, thorn is compared to your thorn. The purpose is to recognize how Paul dealt with his thorn, right? That's what the purpose is. Verse 7, Paul calls this a thorn of the flesh, so it's a physical, some kind of physical thing. The second part is he says it's a messenger of Satan, Okay, that kind of ups the ante a little bit. You're like, okay, so it's a physical thing that has a spiritual power, and somehow Satan is using this now to attack me, destroy me, trying to take me out, to wear me down. That's what's going on. But there's a little bit more. He says, it's been given to him by whom? By Satan? I mean, it says, the thorn was given to me to keep me from being conceited. Would Satan have any issue if one of us got really puffed up and conceited? Absolutely not. Because if you're puffed up and conceited, you're going to pull yourself away from the Lord. You're going to say, I can take care of this. But God is the one ultimately that is using this to keep him from being conceited. So this pain, this suffering that he's going through may have come through Satan, but I want you to know God allowed it so that he could use it. And that's good news for us. And why is that good news? That means the issues that you're going through. I don't know what it is. Maybe a relationship that didn't work out, and you think, ah, how could God ever? No, I'm telling you, God is going to use that. He might be preparing you for another relationship and building you in a way that, you know, he can use you for his glory. Maybe a career frustration. You've been waiting for that job so long, and you kept thinking, it's my turn, it's my turn. But you know what? God might be holding you off for a position that he has you perfectly suited for that you don't even know might come available, friend. So these are his mercies. And what he's doing is he's leading us on new paths of righteousness for his namesake. And the whole list in verse 10, I mean, he includes the whole deal. Maybe you've experienced some of these weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, calamity. I mean, all of those things can be used absolutely by Satan to distract you, destroy you, to pull you apart. But here's the good news, friend. I want you to know. Satan never has the final word. You know that? Satan doesn't have the final word. God has the final word, okay? And he can ultimately use all of that for his good. That's just the kind of God we have. And so that's his main purpose. Verse 7 says, to keep me from being conceited. It says it twice in that verse. And so do you know the greatest enemy in your life isn't actually Satan? It's not your boss or your family member that irritates you and your thorn in your side. It's your pride. 
That's what it is. Pride is like this mother of all sins that leads to all kinds of other sins, friend. Pride starts to lead you to feel self-sufficient. Like, I can take care of this, you know, I can, you know, deal with this, and all of a sudden, you, you start to pull away from the Lord. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I could really take over and control all of my temptations, I think my sinful heart would get pretty pompous. You know what, I, start, I might start to think, you know, I'm pretty good at this Jesus thing. You know, I'm probably an A-plus Christian, so if you need any help, let me kind of help you out. If you need some advice, I can do that. You know, that's what we would start to get built up in our heart, friend. We should never think of ourselves as anything but wretched. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner, friend, and we should recognize that it's only by his grace and his mercy that it's literally Jesus now living through me, you being used for his glory. And so I want to tell you about this one thing. Um, John Newton's his name. He wrote the song Amazing Grace. A lot of us love and know the song Amazing Grace. Well, he wrote this song Amazing Grace. Well, later in his life, in his 80s, he wrote like a bunch of letters to his friends. And one of the letters said, you know what? I thought after 50 60 years of following the Lord that I would really be able to really have complete victory over my temptations. And he realized that some of those temptations are actually now more strong than ever before. And he got actually really depressed for a small season, realizing that, you know what, I, I, I thought I would be able to conquer this, and I didn't, wasn't able. There must be something spiritually wrong with me. And the thing he realized is that he finally wrote to them in this letter that he realized that God would probably let him struggle with some of these until the day he died to keep him from the worst sin, which was pride. Pride that Satan would love to use to pull you away from the Lord. And I've seen this in ministries where people get so proud and, and prideful. So verse 7 says, To keep me from being conceited, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. So I want to tell you, if the goal... If the goal is being dependent upon the Lord, our shepherd, as the objective, if that's the goal, then weaknesses are actually to our advantage, okay? And maybe, I don't know if you've ever heard of this kind of art. It's a Japanese art. It's called kintsugi, okay, kintsugi. And what it is, is they make these beautiful pots, these bowls, and they paint these incredible paintings on the outside. But then do you know what they do? They take the pot and they drop it. And then they, what they do is they put it back together and then they use these gold, this gold to be melted in to hold the pot together and it makes it something incredibly valuable and incredibly beautiful. Friend, really that's what happens with us. We are more valuable to the Lord after we have been broken and the Lord seals up and works in those cracks in our lives and we're actually more valuable to the Lord and, and as he restores us and uses us. The last thing I want to close with is I really believe God wants us to all to get to the point of saying these four words, of, a, of a, a Christian that's following the Lord, that we would be able to say, God is always faithful. Job, boy, he had at heart, God is always faithful. I mean, Joseph, remember he's throwing in the pit, God is always faithful, in prison for years, not just months, years, God is always faithful. Friend, can you say God is always faithful? That the Lord is my shepherd and I have no needs. He is right there. His presence is everything in our lives. And maybe some of you walked in today and you're going through, man, Lord, you're not answering that prayer and it's just a difficult season. And why is this going on in my you know, finances? And why is this going on with my kids and my health isn't very good? Friend, I want you to know your shepherd loves you. He cares for you and he's still up to something good in your life right now. We have a good shepherd and he is working and molding you and using it. How do I know? Because he laid down his life for us. He went to the cross for us. There's nothing that we could have done. He did it all on the cross. So therefore, friend, I want you to know in this season of waiting to see that goodness of God in the land of the living, he will use it in you. He's building you right now. And so I want to uh, encourage you to hold on to the shepherd. 
His presence is right there with you this morning. He may squeeze you. Life may squeeze you. What's getting squeezed out of you? Is it the things of God? Is it His grace and His mercy? Let's pray. Lord, we uh, come before you this morning and we thank you for this um, Psalm 23 and how it really just allows us to rest in you. And I pray that. Some of them may be going through a difficult season and a uh, just a, a broken season. And Lord, where are you? And I pray that they would sense your goodness and your mercy, it's right there. You're pursuing us. And Lord, your presence is never far from us. Father, we thank you for what you did on the cross. And if you did that on the cross for us, Lord, you care about the nitty and the gritty of our lives, the little stuff, Lord. And so may we trust you. May we hold on to you and say, oh God, you are so faithful. You are always faithful. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good to worship with you this morning. So great to have you and in, in worship with us. Uh, I want to encourage you to come back next week, and after the service, we'll have a little meal dedicating the playground. It'll be a wonderful celebration. Hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed week.